All right, why don't we get officially started? Uh, welcome everyone to the penultimate talk in this new voices series on Pichatelet for the summer of 2022. So today, uh, Miceli Seixas de Silva from the University of Santa Maria, uh, where she's a professor of philosophy. Uh, she'll be speaking on, well, you can see the title there, Anal Analysis and Mathematics in de Chatelet's Method for Truth. The floor is yours. So uh, thank you, Vero. Uh, thank you, Clara. And thank you, Ruth, but uh, especially Clara and Aaron for uh, to make this new voices summer and winter series. Uh, they are so interesting, and it's uh, such a um, uh, nice environment to share our researchers. And I feel very proud to be here. Thank you. Uh, well, uh, I'm talking about today uh, on analysis and mathematics and Chatelet's method for truth. And I hope not to be too long. Uh, I try to cut a lot and uh, I prepare uh, a PowerPoint um, work because I feel more comfortable since I'm not a native speaker to talk than to read but some parts I have to read. So the plan uh, of my talk is uh, an introduction to the problem, second part, the method for truth, analysis and synthesis, third part, analysis and mathematics, algebra and calculus, fourth, Duchatelet method and analysis, and um, my conclusion. Uh, it's worth saying that uh, this um, talk, this presentation is something that I'm working recently. I was working uh, in the past few years, but now I'm, uh, but then I leave and then I'm working recently. So it's a work in progress. Uh, I have presented a part of it in the New Voices Conference. And now uh, the research uh, moves forward and I hope to have a good conversation with all of you today. So uh, let's start the first part, introduction. Uh, in the 17th and 18th centuries, uh, there was a fruitful dispute about the use of analytically and synthetically oriented methods as methods for truth in all sorts of scientific discourse. This dispute emerges in the 17th century with Descartes and persists until the 18th century, for example, in Kant's philosophy. Uh, and here, uh, I, I'm not, uh, I will not read, but in the groundwork of Metaphysics of Morals, so in the late 18th century, Kant uh, was using this uh, vocabulary to explain how methods he uh, was using on this uh, text. So uh, this larger dispute, a dispute about methods in science has a special case in mathematics. I'm thinking uh, I'm using mathematics in a broad sense uh, um, as an umbrella for to count and to measure uh, that is for arithmetics and for geometry. Uh, where the algebra and analytic geometry were growing by that time. So it was the revolution in the techniques of mathematics in a broad sense that uh, uh, this dispute appears. So especially in the case of mathematics, the core of the dispute is the emergency, emergency of new techniques which are associated with the method of analysis. More precisely, with the invention of calculus by Newton and Leibniz, the dispute had, has centered on the legitimacy of this method for reaching the truth. So if we look at the historical and philosophical books dedicated to this methodological question, we see names like Fermat, Descartes, L'Hôpital, Leibniz, Newton, Berkeley, etc. But we do not see Duchatelet as a major figure. My working hypothesis, however, is that Duchatelet should figure in this debate as a central voice. So uh, I'm trying to justify it. Why? 
because in her translation of Newton's Principia, Du Châtelet applies new mathematical techniques to solve problems that were controversial in Newton's solutions, and more importantly, that Newton did not prove analytically. She adds a commentary, which is divided into two main parts. The first one is the abbreviated exposition, and the second one, the analytical solution, uh, is a text where she names the terms of the methodological dispute. So, uh, when I arrived at the, the uh, translation of Principia and the commentary, I put some questions. Uh, why did Du Châtelet believe that it was necessary to give the Principia an analytical solution? Does she believe that the method of analysis has legitimacy on its own right? Or does she believe that the Principia should be complemented by the discover method? or the art of invention, the method of analysis. Uh, the very, I think the response is obvious for the qu first question, because the very existence of the solution analytic shows that Du Châtelet is compromised with the necessity of an analytical route. However, this opens two possibilities. Or Du Châtelet believed that the method of analysis has legitimacy by its own right, or uh, her main claim is that the method for truth has two complementary sides, synthesis and analysis, which uh, would be more like an Leibnizian approach to the um, um, relation between the two methods for truth. In the conclusion, I hope, I hope to be able to indicate where a possible answer to the two possibilities above can be found. But so, uh, that's for introduction. Now, my second part, the method for truth analysis and synthesis. So, what is the background of this dispute? Uh, Descartes was the one who is responsible for bringing to light the consideration of analysis as a method to achieve truth in the early modern philosophy environment. More than that, it's assumed that Descartes was following the distinction between analysis and synthesis as established by the Hellenistic compiler Papus, which appeared in 1558 in a Latin translation. The method of, uh, of analysis is explicitly defended by Descartes in the replies to Mersenne's objection to the med uh, meditation method. There, Descartes says, uh, as for the method of demonstration, this divides into two varieties. The first proceeds by analysis and the second by synthesis. Analysis show the, shows the true, uh, the true way by means of which the thing in question was discovered and as it were a priori, so that if the, the reader is willing to follow it and give sufficient attention to all points, he will make the, the thing his own and understands it just as perfectly as if he had discovered it for himself. Synthesis, by contrast, employs a directly opposite method where the search is, as it were, a posteriori, though the proof itself is often more a priori than it is in the analytic method. It demonstrates the conclusion clearly and employs a long series of definitions, postulates, axioms, theorems, and problems. However, this method is not as satisfying as the method of analysis, nor does it engage the minds of those who are eager to learn, since it does not show how the thing in question was discovered. So the method of analysis has a pedagogical importance here in the car. It was synthesis alone that the ancient geometers usually employed in their writings. But in my view, this was not because they were ignorant of analysis, but because they had such a high regard for that, they kept it to themselves like a sacred mystery. Now it is analysis, which is the best and truest method of instruction. And it was this method alone which I employed in my meditations. Uh, until the 17th century, the rigor of the deductive proof was the model for, us, for all sciences, theology, philosophy, natural philosophy, geometry, mathematics, etc. That's why Mersenne is questioning the, the carta about the methods used in the meditations. That is, a metaphysical book, 
We did not follow the deductive method. And that's why Descartes defended it as a good method to reach the truth in metaphysics. But if the method of analysis can benefit metaphysics, why can it benefit mathematics? Mathematicians and scientists in general had an obstacle to their scientific progress if they have only to follow the method of synthesis. It's not easy to solve problems uh, which abounded in the 17th century, based exclusively on theorems, axioms, and principles. Uh, this is why early modern philosophers were convinced that the ancients had covered the way of discovery by publishing only synthetic proofs in geometric books. Geometry books, I'm sorry. On the other hand, Descartes' geometry is an example of, of successful application of the analytical method to solve a problem. The algebraization of geometry, that is, the capacity to prove a theorem in geometry by transforming this problem in an algebraic equation, was possible by the application of the method of analysis. So I will quote Descartes' geometry. Thus, if we wish to solve some problem, we should first of all consider it solved and give names to all the lines, the unknown ones as well as the others, which seem necessary in order to construct it. Then, without considering any difference between the known and the unknown lines, we should go through the problem in the order which most naturally shows the mutual dependence between these lines until we have found a means of expressing a single quantity in two ways. This will be, be called an equation and uh, it follows. So brief analysis, the method of discover is the adequate method for problem solving because we start what we are seeking under the supposition that we have already proven it. And at the end, we arrive to something that is well known. Um, Descartes, uh, um, Descartes' solutions to the purpose problems uh, follows this analytic method. Synthesis, the method of demonstration, we start with what we already know, theorems, axioms, principles, and we deduce what we are seeking. So this was the background, uh, the uh, background of the analysis and synthesis. Now, uh, what analysis and mathematics has to do particularly? Descartes was one of the first to challenge the primacy of the synthetic method for proofing his algebra. But step by step, the new techniques associated with algebra, such as the new calculus, were associated with the method of analysis. So that in the late 17th century, and early 18th century, there was a dispute about the legitimacy of the method of analysis. Uh, D'Alembert, if we look at the Encyclopédie, encyclopédie uh, and the um, uh, analyse uh, uh, written by D'Alembert, we would see this association with algebra, calculus, and analysis. So D'Alembert uh, says, Analyse est proprement la méthode de résoudre les problèmes mathématiques en les révisant des équations. L'analyse pour résoudre les problèmes emploie le secours de l'algèbre ou calcul de grandeur en général. Aussi, ces deux mots, analyse et algèbre, sont souvent regardés comme synonymes. The dispute appears, for example, in Berkeley, uh, the analyst, which aims to criticize both the Leibnizian idea of a quantity infinitely small, necessary for the calculus, uh, and the lack of rigor in mathematical proofs based on analytical methods. So the um, association uh, with the new calculus and all the new techniques of uh, mathematics with the method of analysis uh, were um, uh, clear for these authors. More importantly, it appears in the dispute about the priority of the invention of the calculus between Leibniz and Newton. In a review of a dispute between Leibniz and John Keel about the right of invention of the method of fluxions, the differential method, published by the Royal Society in the Philosophical Transactions, it is said, 
Mr. Newton's method is also of greater use and certainty, being adapted either to the red find out of a proposition by such approximations, as will create no error in the conclusions, or to the demonstrating it exactly. Mr. Leibniz is only for finding it out. When the work succeeds not in infinite equations, Mr. Newton has recourse to converging series and blah, blah, blah. So, by the help of the new analysis, Mr. Newton found out most of the propositions in his Principia. But because, because the ancients for making things certain admitted nothing into geometry before it was demonstrated synthetically, he demonstrated the proposition synthetically that the system of, he of the heavens might be found upon good geometry. And this makes it now difficult for unskillful men to see the analysis by which those propositions were, were found out. So there was a dispute about who have created first the calculus. Leibniz published his differential calculus in Acta Editorum in 1684, and Newton published some parts in Principia in 1687. In fact, Newton will only um, to publish uh, 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 directly uh, an article about a paper about calculus in the 17th, in the 18th century. But the question remains, if Newton had created the calculus before Leibniz, why did Newton did not use calculus uh, in the Principia? In fact, Newton had used the calculus in Principia. Nonetheless, uh, Newton based mostly demonstrations in a synthetic method, as is admitted by uh, the reviewer. Why? Because he believed, it, and that was the canon, that the certainty only could be reached by the ancient method, Euclidean, geometric, synthetic, by demonstration and deduction from principles. In 1787, Newton published, uh, oops, in 1687, Newton published the Principia in which we can find elements of his calculus, that is, he uses elements of the differential calculus in Principia. Nonetheless, as he apparently does not believe in the legitimacy of the analytic method as a method of proof, he believed that it was necessary to provide only synthetic proofs, that is, geometrical ones, to the propositions he would establish it as true. The result was that the Principia is a geometry book, and it was very difficult to be read in his original Latin version. Roughly speaking, Descartes and Leibniz advocated that the new methods for Leibniz, the calculus and for Descartes, the axiomatization of geometry and the development of abstract algebra should be accepted as methods of proof. Newton, on the other hand, oscillated between his admiration for the ancient rigor in geometry, he was frightened by criticism about rigor, and the new possibilities open it with the innovations he himself could experience and develop. The more uh, to be said about Leibniz and his relation to the analysis, the analytical method, because uh, he has a lot of, uh, he had written a lot, and there's some inconsistencies about uh, this, his defense, but at least, at least, uh, I think we can say that for him, um, the analytical method is uh, a method of proof, even if it is necessary uh, to be complemented with the synthetic, the synthetic method. So my working hypothesis is uh, for the answer, why did Duchatelet believe that it was necessary to give the Prinkip an analytical solution? Uh, my hypothesis is that Du Châtelet aimed both uh, first to put Newton in methodological harmony with Leibniz and two, to engage herself in this controversy by showing the importance of uh, the analytical method as a method of proof. So what is the importance of the method of analysis for Du Châtelet? And now we arrive at my fourth part. Apart for, uh, from the solution analytique, I found no direct mention of the dispute between analysis and synthesis in Du Châtelet's works. Please help if someone knows uh, some um, 
some quotation uh, and please uh, send to me. Therefore, my research has a reconstructive spirit. Uh, but I did find mention to the method of analysis, the art of invention, and the role of hypothesis. All of this together with some conjectures about her philosophical influences helped me to build a case. First of all, let's see what we have on hand. The abbreviated exposition, uh, that is the first part of the, her commentary on the translation of Newton's Principia, uh, we can uh, find this, uh, this uh, quotation. It will be useful before giving an account of the way in which the theory of Mr. Newton explains celestial phenomena to give a brief idea of our planetary system. The truths, the truths discovered by Mr. Newton will necessarily be part of this exposition, but the explanations of how he arrived at them will be deferred to subsequent chapters. This chapter will contain only the exposition of the phenomena as such. So my first note is that the task of the solution analytic is to show how Newton arrived at the truths he discovered, is to show the way of discovery. So the solution analytic aim is to unveil how the truths are discovered. Second, uh, after having explained these laws and having drawn from them several corollaries, so the synthetic method, I have some laws and then I draw from them corollaries, I deduct, uh, it's a deductive method. Mr. Newton begins his first book with 11 lemmas that make up the perception. He sets forth in these 11 lemmas his method of first and last ratios. This method is the foundation of the geometry of the infinity, and with its help, this geometry has all the certainty of the old one. So, second note, uh, the method uh, which is the foundation of the geometry of the infinity is the method by which several corollaries are drawn from some laws. By this method, the geometry has all the certainty of the old one. So the method that guarantees the certainty of the old one is the method of synthesis. Okay, so the third. So on this point, as on the rest of the theory of the moon, the greatest mathematicians of this century have abandoned the route followed so far by the commentators on Mr. Newton and believed that they would reach their goal sooner by starting all over again. They have sought to determine directly the paths and speeds of any three attracting bodies. We hope in a little while to see the successful outcome of their work. The analytical method they follow appears to be the only satisfactory one in an investigation of this nature. The third note is that uh, the greatest mathematicians have abandoned the route followed so far by the commentators of his own Mr. Newton and also I think Newton itself. They believed that they would reach the successful outcome, the truth, by following the analytical method. So Newton followed the synthetical method and the analytical method, but the analytical method is the only satisfactory one in an investigation of this nature, an investigation in astronomy. So brief, uh, we have the three notes. Uh, the solution analytic aims to unveil how the truths are discovered. The method that guarantees the certainty of the old one is the method of synthesis. Newton and Newtonians follow the synthetical method, but the analytical method is the only satisfactory one in an investigation of this nature. Uh, now, uh, I will have some conjectures on method and analysis for Du Chatelet based on readings and possible influences. 
as I said before, I'm trying to build a case. So uh, I'm trying to collect some evidence to defend uh, uh, her understanding of this point. First of all, in a letter to Laurent François Pro, her publisher for the foundations, she exposes her uh, library. She said, I have the optics of Newton, who were commented on by Clark, Wisdom la figure de la Terre, Figure Désastre, Lucien Brock Physique, Grave de Saint Physique, Clark, uh, the Entretien Physique, uh, the Fata Renault, um, Euclid, Pardi, Malaisieux, Application de l'algebra à la géométrie, de Guisne, the Section Conique, uh, de L'Hôpital, the Mathematique Universelle, and the Oeuvre of Descartes. So she was. Uh, clearly occupied with Descartes, but I wanted to, uh, to point that um, especially uh, the influence of uh, Marquis, de, uh, especially a possible influence of Marquis de L'Hôpital. Marquis de L'Hôpital was uh, one of the first French mathematicians to study Leibnizian calculus. More than that, L'Hôpital was uh, also the one who defended openly the method of analysis. In the preface uh, of L'Analyse des Infiniment Petit pour l'Intelligence de l'Incourbe, L'Hôpital gives a history of this method, stating that Descartes was the first to leave the ancients behind, but also sits Fermat, Barrow, Leibniz, Iberlin. Um, besides uh, the conical sections, the book conical sections that she uh, says that she has, uh, has the name uh, Traité analytique des sessions coniques et de leur usage pour la résolution des équations dans les problèmes tant déterminés qu'en déterminés. So, uh, I think that uh, this, this uh, uh, influence by Marquis de L'Hôpital could have um, uh, some weight in her um, decision to make a solution analytic for the problems Newton had um, confronted by the synthetic method. Uh, so possible influence. Uh, Leibniz, uh, he had uh, work a lot on this topic, uh, especially in the texts that are remitted on the main the art of controversies. Also, Clairaut, dans les éléments d'algèbre, dans les éléments de géométrie. And also, uh, what is interesting, but uh, I'm not, um, uh, I will say something in the last, but uh, is that Maria Gaetana Agnesi in Italy also had in 1749 uh, a book, Istituzione Analitiche, uh, where she was working on the method of analysis for didactic and pedagogical um, goals. So, uh, in the Elements uh, d'Algebre, the 1746, uh, Claire Rosses, je me suis proposé de suivre dans cet ouvrage la même méthode que dans les éléments de géométrie. J'ai tâché de donner les règles de l'algèbre dans un ordre que les inventeurs puissent pour suivre. L'univérité n'y est présentée sous la forme de théorème. Tout semble être découvert en s'exerçant sur les problèmes que les besoins ou la curiosité ont fait entreprendre de résoudre. So, uh, Clairaut is clearly saying that he was following in the element de Gèvre, also in the element de géométrie, uh, the method of analysis. So if we uh, put together uh, the, these, those two conjectures, we have that Duchatelet knew the debate and the characters of the dispute. So it's not by chance that her work is called analytical solution. Beyond that, she was aware of the methods dispute and she wants to implicate Newton and herself on this debate. So I'm going to my conclusion. 
we can return to the two possibilities left behind. Duchatelet believed that the method of analysis has legitimacy by its own, or Duchatelet's main claim is that the method for truth has two complementary sides, synthesis and analysis. I do not believe that Duchatelet has a strong compromise with the first possibility. Instead, I think that there are elements to defend the second claim. And that's uh, my uh, path now. To defend this, I would like to remember an aspect of her epistemology and call attention to the chapter on hypotheses in the foundations. Du Chatelet is an experimental philosopher, is an experimental philosopher with a gift. There are a lot of evidence that Du Chatelet accepts the methods of experimental philosophy. For, for example, the use of induction in the essay of fire. But also, there are a lot of evidence that she understands that the experience should be guided by rational principles. This is the gift uh, to lead to knowledge or to truth, the principle of sufficient reason and principle uh, of non-contradiction in foundation. foundations are the evidences. Furthermore, she considers that the methods used by experimental philosophy, philosophers not only need to be confirmed by mathematics, by the synthetic method, but that they have some limits. What limits? One, uh, and now it's a quotation from the chapter on hypothesis. One of the mistakes of some philosophers of our time is to want to banish hypotheses from physics. They are as necessary as the scaffolding in a house being built. It's true that when the building is completed, the scaffold becomes useless, but it could not have been erected without it. Our of astronomy, for example, is founded only on hypotheses. And if they had always been avoided in physics, it seems that fewer discoveries could have been made. So nothing is more likely to delay the progress of the sciences than to want to banish them. This is why the application of the geometric principles of mechanics to physical effects, which is very difficult and very necessary, remains imperfect and why we find ourselves deprived of the work and the research of several fine geniuses who would perhaps have been able to discover the true cause of phenomena. The scaffold metaphor teaches that to make progress in science, we need to make hypotheses, even if afterwards they are no longer useful, just as the way of discover can seem, can seem useless after discover. Astronomy is one of the science that could not progress without hypotheses. It represents a limit in experimental philosophy. Therefore, it's true hypothesis that discovers, discoveries are made in this science. This is why the application of the geometric principles of mechanics to physical effects, the synthetic side, which is very difficult and very necessary, remains imperfect without the analytical side. Uh, she talks uh, in the chapter of hypothesis, she talks also about the hypothesis as some part of the art of invention. And she says, by distinguishing between the good and the bad use of hypothesis, both extremes are avoided. And without giving oneself up to fictions, a method very necessary to the art of invention is not denied to the sciences. A method that is the only means that can be used in difficult researches requiring correction over several centuries and the work of several men before attaining a certain perfection. So, the art of invention is what the 17th and the 18th century philosophers called the method of analysis. They called the art of invention, the art of discovery, and uh, all of these were uh, synonyms. In difficult research, like astronomy, we need to complete the synthetic method by the analytical method. In fact, the, uh, the way is we have the analytic method, we make hypotheses, 
and we try to prove them. We assume the hypothesis as if uh, it were proved, and then we, uh, we reach the truth. And then we make the other way round uh, uh, by the synthetical method. In this analytical method, the method by means of which, with the aid of certain gigs, one arrives at knowledge of one knows, in order to explain complicated and difficult phenomena, we can hope to make progress in science. The solution analytique has therefore a double function. Uh, first of all, uh, the solution analytique has an epistemic goal to rescue the importance of the analytical method as a method of searching for truth in science. But more than that, uh, the solution analytique has a pedagogical goal it's to show how science can progress to the methods of experimental philosophy on difficult questions. And that's it. Thank you.